Hello my friends, welcome back for another Oxygen Not Included tutorial. This one is going to help explain this big mess that you see on my screen right now. And this big mess is a bunch of pipes and we're going to be talking about piping today. Uh, this is hopefully to answer one of the most common issues that I think newer players struggle with. And that is trying to set up some piping and getting some bugs in there and not knowing how to resolve it. And I think that can be very frustrating and it can take a lot of time to resolve. So I'm just going to run you through a bunch of uh, different examples here, a bunch of basics, and then we'll come back and we'll be able to hopefully explain all this in a way that is uh, pretty straightforward. So I like to start off by just showing what your base could potentially look like uh, at the end of the game when it comes to piping. And this is only liquid piping too. We're going to cover all types. So this is what liquid piping could look like. Uh, you could also get some stuff in the ventilation. So ventilation is going to be another big deal. And you could also get some stuff in uh, shipping. So shipping can also be part of this too. So I'm going to be talking about all these types of piping. We'll be back here at the end of the video to take a look at those examples and hopefully make a little bit more sense out of them. So let's jump into some examples now. All right, friends, welcome to my filming sandbox, which is basically just a big map for us to do some experimentation on and to kind of demonstrate some concepts. So that's where we are now. The first concept that I want to talk about is just to prepare us for the rest of the video. For most of the rest of the video, I'm going to be talking about liquids and piping around liquids, but just note that the principles that we talked about can be used on any state of matter. So that includes gas, which you can put a gas pump in and a gas vent in just to be able to move in between the two. Go ahead and set that up. And uh, just note that no matter what type you have, the rules are all pretty much the same for piping. So in this for in this example, the uh, you can see the directionality over here, but the flow of the pipe will always be away from the green and into the white. Uh, so there will be little helpers that come up here to kind of demonstrate that. And that can be one of the slightly confusing things for uh, beginner players as well. So the principles are exactly the same for pretty much every other type as well. So we might as well set that up. Liquid pump, liquid vent. Same thing goes for solids too. You can basically pipe solids. Oh, whoops, I need to do this correctly. Let's just go ahead and cancel this. You can pipe solids through the shipping network. So we have a bunch of solids on the ground here. And the same uh, equivalents for solids are this conveyor loader and this conveyor chute. So we'll just connect them by conveyor rail. It's the exact same idea, uh, although we do need something that will actually load it. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll hook all, the, hook all this stuff up to power and we'll see the equivalents for all three states of matter. Let me get this set up as soon as the filter's refreshed. There we go. But yeah, you can see that... Oh, we didn't hook up the pipes here. Ha ha ha. There we go. So you can see that everything is flowing away from the green and into the white. They're all going the same direction. They all have the same properties. So I just wanted to talk about that really fast because the rest of this is going to be mostly revolving around liquid since it is the easiest thing to visualize. So example number one, let's say you have a bunch of these bristle blossom pl blossoms planted. And since these need water, you can plant them inside these hydroponic farm tiles. And if you look at the plumbing overlay, these all have white markers on them, meaning that's an intake for the building, uh, which means that water goes there. So we need to pump it from something that sends it. So let's say we find a pool of water here. Let's go ahead and put down a liquid pump. Let's set up our piping, which I'm just going to do something like this. And note that I'm connecting all these one at a time and not drawing a line straight through. We'll explain a little bit more about that in just a bit, but I would recommend setting up all your piping to be something like this where it's uh, going to each one individually unless you have a reason for it to go through, which for food is not a great use case. So let's go ahead and hook this up and we'll just see a basic example of the pipe flow. So it's going to flow, I'll speed this up to super speed by the way, it's going to flow down these pipes and it will flow into the places that they're supposed to go, which I sped it up to super speed because sometimes just watching water flow through pipes can be kind of boring. But so we've got water flowing to every plant. Every plant is now getting water and that's great. So what happens if this, let's say, runs out of water or you don't want to pump from here anymore or something like that? Let me go ahead and turn this off. And let's say we find another pool of water somewhere else. And this is a trap that a lot of beginner players can get into. So say we find a pool of water here. So, all right, cool. Let's set up a pump here. 
And oh, we found another one here. Oh, let's set up a pump here too. Which I need to go in the right category. So let's set up some piping to this. Hmm, how should we set up some piping? I think what a lot of beginner players will do is they'll just think like, oh, here's a pipe and it has the same type of thing, so I'm just going to hook it up like that. And maybe they'll do something like this over here as well. Well, they'll hook it up like this. And in, in the minds of them, and I've made this mistake myself, a lot of people make this mistake. This is one of the biggest reasons why I decided to make this tutorial is because this will present bugs. And I'll show you exactly why. So what I want you to do whenever you're hooking up anything like this is I will want you to visualize kind of where the stuff that you're piping is going to flow. And I'm messing up because I'm talking and trying to do stuff at the same time. I want you to visualize where this is going to flow. And as we know, it flows away from the green and to the white. So if I were to draw, let's say, how do we get water from this all the way up here, right? So you can visualize how it's going to go up here, up this pipe. It'll go past all these, up here, and then finally into there, right? There is a problem with this. Let's draw the direction of the flow. So the direction of the flow goes this way, and yes, these are my piping arrows. Then once it gets up here, the direction of the flow goes this way, as it heads down along this pipe, and then it goes up, and then it goes back over there. So that's the direction going from here all the way up to here. The problem is that you have other pu other pumps that are contradicting these directions. And this can cause a lot of uh, piping problems later on. So for example, on this line right here, this one, if you were to draw a line from here to this one, this would be going, whoops, in this direction. Now we have a conflict where water could be going down either side. And if you ever run out of water or if you hook more stuff up, this can really block up the pipes. Same thing going from like this down to this bottom one. It's going to travel along here going in this direction. But the problem is that, oh, it's now going against the flow of something else. So we effectively have it going in both directions here. And this can be a big problem. Let me turn this up to super speed again to show you why. And that's because uh, if this ever gets turned off or runs out or maybe you hook something different up, this conflict is going to leave water not going to one of the places that you need it to go. And uh, it can happen in a whole bunch of different ways. So that's why you need to pay attention to the directionality of your uh, pipe setups. You want to make sure that it's all flowing in one direction as opposed to having these conflicts. I'm going to super speed this, hopefully get it to a point where we can actually demonstrate this. I probably should have built this a little bit closer to show this example a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, we didn't. We made a mistake. We'll get there, though. Um... I'm just going to stall for time because I didn't do something at a good time. Uh, <laughs> there's not much more I can do to hammer this in other than saying this is happening in the wrong direction. All right, we're getting close. Uh, once we get down to this last packet, you will notice that there is not going to be flow from here up into here. So the flow going from this up to this tile is not happening. And that's because these pipes are confused. They don't know which way they want to flow. This is going to turn out to be really bad for these plants because now these plants are not going to get watered because of how we hook this up. Uh, this can be a big problem, and I've seen a lot of players run into it. I even ran into it myself a whole bunch of times, and this is really hard to debug. So let's set this up the better way. Let me destroy all these extra pipes just to get them out of our way. Whoops, we're making a mess. Let me rehook this up. Uh, we'll get rid of these arrows as well, which I probably should just deconstruct these since that's what, that'll be easier. There we go. I have a bunch of stuff falling, and that's great. So, what will happen, what we should do is we should not hook it up this way. What we want to do is we want to force the same direction in all of our pipes. So I want to force the same direction going down on all these pipes. And what I can do to enforce that is I would probably delete this which uh, will make a big mess because we uh, are just deleting pipes without deleting the water. And the way I would hook this up is I would make sure to hook it up in a pipe that I know is going to flow in the right direction. So the direction is going this way, and then it's going down this way. So if I were to hook up new sources, I would probably want to hook it up something like this so that the flow I know is always going to be in the same direction. It's going to flow this way. It's going to flow up. It's going to flow up this pipe. 
and then finally join this pipe to go right and then down and I won't get any more of these plumbing conflicts no matter if I add sources or if I turn them on and off. You definitely want to think about how your pipes are flowing uh, when you're setting this stuff up so you don't run into bugs and stuff like that. So that is one of the biggest piping problems that people have. And if you have it all flowing in the same direction, you will never run into that. So just make sure that when you're setting this up, you know where it's going. All right, next example, let's talk about a couple of tricks you can do to distribute things in certain ways. So I have a setup here that's just a, you know, room of water, nothing super special. Let's say I have a bunch of different sources here, and this is going to be not super, like, uh, visibly, like, obvious example, but I want to show you some tricks you can do with piping. So what I could do is I could hook all these things up like this. But let's say I wanted these two to be filled up entirely before these two get filled up. There can be reasons to do that, and I want to show you the best way to do that without having to micromanage the pipes. Instead of drawing a line that's just down like this, this will distribute it pretty evenly between all of them. Instead, what I would do is I would build a bridge. I would take the bridge and I would put it here to kind of intercept the flow from the pipe and to be going down this line until these are all entirely full and satisfied. Uh, and let's just go ahead and set this up so you can see it running. So what you'll see is that this will intercept it because it's on the same line and it will all travel down the first intake it gets to and it won't stop until all these are totally full. So let's say I went ahead and filled up this entire room uh, with water. Eventually these things will get backed up and not be able to flow anymore once the pressure gets too high. Once that point happens, these inputs or intakes will all be entirely satisfied and it will start to bypass this because these are all uh, up, to, up to par. It's up to what they need. So they're going to start getting blocked up and that's when you're going to start getting the flow bypassing it once these things are like, okay, cool, I'm satisfied and now it's going to pass it to go somewhere else. So that's definitely a trick you can use with these bridges is to force which way something is going. You can also do this if you have a second source. So let's make a second water source here real quick. And let's say for whatever reason, I wanted to prioritize the output of one over the other. So we could do the same thing with these bridges. Let me sample this, let's fill this up. I could do the same thing, but let's say I want it from here before I get it from here. Let's say that this is like a renewable source and this is not a renewable source. So I always want to use the renewable one first. So what I would do here is I would make sure that I'm again, preserving the direction of flow, but I would use a bridge to, uh, or sorry, I have this hooked up the other way. This will prioritize this line first before we get anything from here. So just what I said, but backwards. <laughs> what the bridge does is that the bridge makes it so that uh, if anything is connected this way, it will get stalled because there is already flow on this line. So if I want to prioritize getting all of the water out of here first, I can set it up this way with a bridge so that this will all be taken before this can actually flow through. So this is effect effectively stopped up. This is kind of like my backup source. Uh, you could do this for various reasons. Like let's say you want to use the hot water before you use the cold water or vice versa. Uh, you could do it that way. Or if you wanted to use the germy water before you use the clean water. Uh, a bunch of different reasons why these pipes could be set up this way. Let's talk about a couple of other things. Let's talk about shutoffs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and deconstruct some of these pipes here. We'll get rid of all this. Shutoffs are going to be a way for you to control flow via automation. So let's take a liquid shutoff here and let's drop it on the line. Like we were talking about before, this is just going to steal the uh, whole input, or sorry, the whole flow of the pipe until it doesn't want it anymore. So let's go ahead and hook this up. Now this is not going to work right now because we don't have this thing powered and we don't have it on automation. So let me go ahead and hook those two things up real fast. And this automation can be hooked up to pretty much anything. Let's say if we have automation saying that like, oh, this needs water right now and this needs all the water that I have. Let's say it's a cooling system for a volcano or something like that. And we know we absolutely need that over sending cooling to something that's a little bit less urgent. So if we absolutely needed cooling from this water, we would have the automation turn it on and it would effectively steal all of the output from the pipe while this was turned on. If I was like, okay, this is happy now, we don't need to have this flowing anymore, I could turn the shutoff off via automation 
and then it'll just get bypassed. So another setup you can use with this, and this shutoff will come in handy a little bit later in the tutorial. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to go over the basics of bridges and shutoffs in order to control flow very specifically. Let's talk a little bit about storage. Um, a common thing is going to be that you will get water from a whole bunch of different sources. You'll probably want to store it in one central location. There's a couple of storage options you can go with. One of which that we've been doing so far is basically just dumping it into another room. Uh, so we have, if we have like 10 different sources, they might all dump into the same room. They might all dump in there intermittently. So let's just pretend that these are all hooked up to a bunch of other sources out on the map. Uh, and I'll just put the bridge there just to demonstrate the directionality of how they will flow. So they'll all be coming from different places. They'll be merging, going down this line, and eventually dropping in this room. Uh, this is a way to store it that can be very uh, resource light. Like, you don't need to really spend anything to do this. You just need to build a couple of rooms. And this is going to be the central place where you store it. Another option you can use is you can use these uh, reservoirs. They have either liquid reservoirs or gas reservoirs. If you place a handful of these down... Uh, and then you change your piping to be uh, different than what it is right now. Let's say we want to store it in some of these reservoirs. The advantage to this, and the reason I would do it this way, I'm just going to draw a line straight through all these inputs, and then I draw a line all the way through these outputs. The advantage that these uh, have is that you have some like more straightforward visibility as to what is actually happening with your water storage. So I know that this one's going to get filled up first, and I'll put it on super speed here. You effectively get like a meter that shows what your overall storage is if you set it up this way. So I know that my storage is not very full because only one of these has a small bar on it. Whereas this one, I could kind of guess. That'd be a little bit harder to know. The other advantage that you get is that if we have a central storage area, in order to get the water out of this area, which I'll just go ahead and sample. We'll add a little bit more here, by the way. Let's add like this much. Just brush it in like this. There we go. If I want to then pump it from my central place over to something that might use it, like let's say we have uh, food tiles out on the map somewhere, or if we have something that just takes water or whatever, um, if I need to get it back out of here, I then need to spend more power. Whoa. I then need to spend more power to actually hook this thing up this way. So I'm spending power to both put it into here and also spending power to get it out. The good thing about these reservoirs is they don't require any extra power. And they effectively give you free flow so that whatever is powering this is effectively what you're paying to move it both into your central storage and to have that storage flow into somewhere else. So that can be a pretty cool thing as well. Okay, I'm taking a big deep breath because I feel so bad talking about this and I don't want to because I just think it's wrong from like a moral perspective and I know I'm gonna sound really dumb. But let's talk about the hidden arts of storage. Uh, yeah, we're gonna go down to like the hell of our map, which is way down here to talk about some crazy stuff with storage. This can work for both gases and liquids. Uh, what you can do and the problem with uh, any sort of storage like this is that once you get filled up like we saw here, this cannot add any more. So the resting state of a lot of these liquids, especially waters, is about a thousand kilograms per tile. Meaning that this physical space can only hold so much water based upon how big it is. Ah, oh, I feel so dirty doing this. Okay. But what you can do is you can set up something like this where you can overpressurize this infinitely to store as much as you want in here. And there's a little trick that you can do and I'll show you how to do that. So I'm gonna drop a liquid vent in. And I have two different types of liquid here, by the way. One of them is polluted water, and that's the main thing I want to store that's on the bottom. The other is water, which is on the top here, which I don't want to store, but that's going to allow us to kind of abuse and exploit in here. So let's say that we have an, a huge amount of polluted water for whatever reason. Uh, let me sample this, fill this up. I can store all of this polluted water in this little space because of this exploit. And I would normally not show this. It's like I said, I feel so bad doing this, but it's a thing. It's a thing that other people get a lot of use out of and that you can use if you want to be a super user. I just feel bad about breaking the game in this way or kind of abusing it. What will happen is this vent will never get blocked up because there's always going to be this layer of water saying that, oh yeah, there's, there's, you're allowed to vent here. There's no pressure that's stopping you from venting here. 
whereas the polluted water is just going to get more and more and more pressurized over time because nothing is actually stopping the flow in here. So if I were to super speed this, we can see how fast this will actually speed or fill up. You can store as much as you really want in here and you're only going to use this little amount of space. It will also not break these tiles because airflow tiles in particular will never break due to being overly pressurized. If I were to try to do this, oh, it looks like it will eventually get blocked up, but there are ways to prevent this. Uh, only because there's enough uh, water here. Let me actually fix this really quickly. You need to put in a low enough amount so that if it gets compressed down to one tile, it's not going to block it. So my bad for actually doing that incorrectly. Let's do this correct for once. So the amount of water that I'm going to put in here is much, much less than it was before. Let's go to water. We're going to put even like, you know, a handful of kilograms in there. So there's barely anything that will be blocking it. Let's continue to overpressurize this. And there we go. This will be going forever. Assuming we do it correctly, which I totally did not at the beginning. So the amount of polluted water here is just going to continue to grow endlessly. And uh, the airflow tiles prevent it from breaking. This is, again, a huge exploit that you can have to uh, abuse and put whatever you want in here. And it's only by virtue of this one tile of water being down around like 70 kilograms or whatever that is never going to be more pressurized than this. This can be a little bit tricky to set up, but this is basically a way to get infinite storage. Um, and I know this isn't necessarily a uh, part of piping, but this is a way to store water. And this was something that I talked about before, so I don't want to be... I don't want to be uh, oh, skipping this, even though it's kind of a, a popular part of the game that a lot of people like to use. Let's just keep this on super speed just to demonstrate that we can actually drain the whole thing and store it all in this one place. You may get some weird pressure fluctuations in here, but uh, the whole idea is that if you were to pre-build this with a pump, now you can use, like if this were to take up a whole big block of storage, this all just gets condensed down to the small, condensed down to the small thing. It only works because liquids and gases and stuff like that will typically stack in a certain order and you will know where they stack based upon like their density. Um, so that's something you can definitely do to abuse this. Okay, so let's talk about some other stuff. Let's talk about different pipes to use for different situations. Let's pretend this middle area is our base and our base needs to remain fairly temperate so that we can grow food there. And so we can uh, have duplicates living there without taking damage from being too cold or too hot. So let's go ahead and set up some pumps. And let's say I need to get my oil from here to here. And let's say I need to get polluted water from here to here. Now the oil is very, very hot. It's at 170 Fahrenheit, which is just below boiling. Um, so I don't want this oil to be heating up my base. If I were to do this in a way that I just set pipe through here and it went all through my base and then went out the other side, this would heat up my base very, very much. So I want to select a type of pipe that's going to prevent as much heat transfer as possible. That's why I'm going to use the insulated pipe. So let's say we want to build it out of something that's a pretty good material for it. Something like sedimentary rock, obsidian, and if you can make ceramic, those are all really good options. Let's just build it out of ceramic for the sake of it. Let's send it over here. And now we are minimizing the amount of heat transfer that happens between the two different... Uh, between the, the pipe and the air that's around it because of the type of pipe that we're using. If we want to encourage it, by the way, this is so hot that it's damaging my pump, which we're not gonna worry about too much, but if we want to encourage heat transfer, let's say we wanna cool things, I would use a radiant pipe. This is all fairly straightforward, but I just want you to know that heat exchange happens between uh, different things all the time. And pipes are definitely no exception. It's one way to either encourage or discourage heat transfer based on the type of piping that you use. And this may seem very obvious. I just wanted to note that because even right now you can see the temperature dropping because I'm piping cold water through here. Whereas up here it's staying relatively the same even though the oil that's in here is much hotter than the polluted water that's coming through here. So just wanted to mention that really fast. All right, so now that we know a lot of the ideas and kind of basics behind a lot of this stuff, uh, we can move on to the next section, which is gonna be talking about some practical examples of things that you might encounter that you may need to use piping for. I'm gonna be fairly brief with those and just show some basic stuff. And I'll also show one uh, advanced example before we get back to the real base so that we can talk over all the examples that are there. So. Let's jump over to that uh, second part, which is going to be on a new map since I kind of preset these up or whatever. But yeah, I'll see you there in just a second. 
Whoa, we're on the next map. All right, let's look at some more examples. <laughs> Getting weird looks. All right, so let's talk about uh, cleaning water and different ways to store different types of water. So what I have here are examples from later in the game that you should be striving for, which is capturing a bunch of different water sources. So we have like salt water, we have some polluted water with germs in it, we have some cold polluted water, we have some regular water, and basically just ways to pipe to store all these in a nice way. Also to clean them and then put them back into like a central storage area. So my first thought on this is how do I want to store this? Again, you can just put this into open containers, but I'm going to continue to use the, um, the reservoirs because they have a lot of utility and it's good to get familiar with that kind of stuff. So I'm going to set up a couple of rows here to store different types of uh, water that I might get before they get processed just so I'm not backing these things up and I make sure I maximize this and they're only getting backed up when I already have a huge amount of reserves for them. So let's say this top one is for salt water. Let's say this bottom one is for polluted water. So what I'll want to do is I will want to just pipe those into their own individual places and in order to capture these little areas I would probably put a liquid pump in there like this um, I would not run this all the time. This is going to be a little bit of nuance that might not, necessar not necessarily be needed for this, but I'm going to put in a hydro sensor just to make sure that we only pump this out when there's a good amount of water. So let's say we want this only when we're above like 100 kilograms on this tile up here. So this will erupt for quite a while before we actually start drying it up. So let's just pretend that this happened. Oh, I need to use a better pump. Whoops. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Let's uh, cancel this. Deconstruct this. Let's just pretend that this has happened for a little while because this can take a little while to fill up But I do want to like create these in a way that's realistic for uh, The rest of the things you're gonna be doing in the game So I'm just, just gonna set it up like this and as soon as this gets full enough, we will be good to go So I'm just gonna sample this And we'll set it to I don't know quite a bit something like this So that once this is activated it turns on and it says, okay, I can pump water out of this now. Did I just do the exact same thing? I need a different material. What am I doing? All right, let's go ahead and get a better material, not pyrite. Let's get gold amalgam. There we go. And we'll start pumping this out, and I want to lead this straight into the area that I'm going to store salt water. So like I said before, just draw a line through the inputs. We'll set up something like this. I'll do the same thing for this other one, just for the sake of example. So we'll copy this, put it in there. Same thing as before, we'll use the hydro sensor and we'll use automation to determine when it can turn on and off. We'll sample this and we will go ahead and fill this. All right. Now for both of these, since they're the exact same thing, I don't really care which is coming first. So I'm just gonna pump both of them in equally and they'll just both go to my salt water storage. From there on my salt water storage, I want to uh, pump these guys out and I usually want to go the opposite direction of when these things came in. So this is flowing to the right to fill these up. I want to bring it back this way just so that my meters make sense. This is not necessary. This is just something that I like to do so I can visually scan over this and see how much I actually have. So I would probably run it down something like this and get rid of this extra block here because we don't necessarily need that. And then in order to turn this into water that I can actually use for like uh, oxygen or for plants or something like that, I want to turn this into regular water, which I'm going to go ahead and use the desalinator for. So I'm gonna set up something like this. Again, we need to go from green to white. So I wanna plug this into the white here. And then the output is just gonna be regular water. So I'm gonna go like this. Let me set up some power. And again, I'm going to store all this in uh, separate uh, tanks just like these so I'm going to set that up as well this is just going to be for our clean water get some liquid reservoirs in here set it up the exact same way and there we go now we should have a full flow between the saltwater geyser into the desalinator which is going to turn it into normal water and then down into our storage tanks we should be getting some flow here. There we go. All right, so now we're getting some flow of some clean water. Same thing, we don't really wanna cross the lines. We can't send polluted water into this, so we need a separate source. So I'm gonna go ahead and set these up for the exact same thing. We'll set up some pumps here and here. Note these are two different types, and I need to pay attention to 
what's actually coming out of these things. This is coming out at 86 degrees Fahrenheit, but this is coming out at only 14. So if I were to uh, turn this into clean water immediately after that, it would just freeze and it would start breaking my pipes. So I need some way to either exchange the heat or to balance this out. So at least for right now, I'm just going to hook both of these up to the same source. And we'll talk about how to uh, change this a little bit later. I'm going to build a bridge to go over the parts that I want to not intersect. So that's also one application of the bridge that I feel like is pretty straightforward. So I'm not going to spend too much time explaining that. And into my second tank here, which is going to be all full of polluted water. And we're going to have this flow out and down into a... Uh, I always forget what this is called. Water sieve. Or sieve, I think is how it's pronounced. Not something I say on an everyday basis. But there we go. We have it flowing from our polluted sources into these tanks and then into the water sieve. And because this is water that I might want to store in the same place, I could put it here. But the thing that I might want to watch out for is that this could have germs in it. So I might not want to store this in the same place if I want this to go to like oxygen, for example. I don't want to be creating oxygen with germy water. So I might send it somewhere else into places that are okay with the germs, like into plants or into another room to remove the germs. So instead of merging these two lines, I would instead draw it and avoid these a little bit, which you kind of want to plan out how you're putting all these piping together and uh, try to build it in a way that's going to be sustainable so that you can expand and kind of like maneuver around and stuff like that. So this is a basic water setup. I'm going to have a whole video that's set up for exclusively uh, water setups that uh, should be used in like a real game and deal with all the nuance. So I'm not going to go too much further than this, but I just wanted to walk you through a basic example of how I would set something up for water. It would look something like this. Uh, we're not going to necessarily see the full flow because I didn't hook everything up, but uh, let me get the rest of this hooked up. We'll go to other examples and then we'll check back on this in just a little bit as it may be relevant with another one of my examples. So we'll hook this up. Let me sample this. Increase the mass. Fill. There we go. And fill. There we go. Let's hook up some power. We're going to be very sloppy with this because I'm trying to do it fast. You want this to work if it's above 100. Copy these settings, apply here and here and there, and we need power up here as well. So this is about what a full water setup would look like, except for these would be a lot more dispersed around the map. Also for this regular water geyser, uh, this may be an example of if I have cooled water and I don't want to necessarily work with this hot water, I might make sure that all my other sources are flowing and filling up these tanks before I hook this one up which again, we could just use with a bridge. Whatever is coming across the bridge and going into these pipes, like here, for example, if I wanted to hook it in there, that would need to make sure that there was not flow happening on this pipe already before it would get filled up. Another thing to pay attention to, and this can also matter in some situations, only a certain quantity of something can actually flow down a pipe. So liquid pipes can only take 10, 10 kilograms of water uh, at a time, like in one of these packets. So if you ever are trying to like split pipes or do anything fancy with that, just bear in mind how much can go down at once. Uh, packets will combine inside the pipes if they can. Like if there's two packets of water that are of different sizes that will add up to like 10 kilograms or less, then it will combine them. Um, so that's another thing that can happen as well. I'm glossing over this because I wanted to show that we started from literally no pipes at all. And now we have a whole like piping network that we put together. Uh, with the knowledge that we've acquired from previous parts. And we can see the flow from everywhere. Nothing too unusual here. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to demonstrate that example because that's one of the first things you're probably going to solve for. Speaking of germy water, this water down here might be germy. Another place we can actually send that to is bathrooms. So let's set up some bathrooms here really quickly. This will demonstrate like a massive usage of a lot of these things at once. And I guess generally how to set up bathrooms. It's not really something that's talked about too often. So for bathrooms, let's say the rest of my base is over here, which I'll just make bigger for the sake of visualization. So this is our whole base and these are the bathrooms that we have in there, right? So let me do this. Let's fill it all up with oxygen because we like oxygen in our base. So our duplicates can breathe. We set this up, we're going to set this up so that the uh, it's only one way to get in and out of the bathroom. And the toilets are further away from the door than the sinks. So I'll just keep that on auto, but I would normally open that. What I want to do is I want to set my sink direction to be when they leave the bathroom so that their hands are clean before they go back out in the world. 
which is definitely examples that we could all be following right now. So let's set up the piping for this as well. Since these can take germy water, I don't necessarily want to use my clean water on that. I'd rather use the germy water if I can. So let's set this to go all the way up here. And you probably don't want to have this just stripe all the way across. You want to actually distribute this fairly evenly so that we're not uh, getting our supply cut off on one building or the other. And then a particular piping trick that I do for these is I will actually give these a lot of like slack, if that makes sense. I'll give them a lot of excess pipe so that if I'm flushing all the toilets and using all the sinks at the same time, we don't start to back it up because the pipes get full. So I'll do something like this before sending them all down a pipe. And these are all going to be producing polluted water. So I'd probably just send it right back into here and we'll need to find the right place to put this. So these are all outputs. I would send this back over. And I don't want to just hook it up like right here because then there's going to be conflicts on these lines. You're going to have stuff that's coming from here going down and stuff that's coming from here going back the other way. So I would run the pipe all the way down to this point right here, or you could even do it to this one, which would mean that the flow from the bathroom is going to be prioritized over the flow from these sources. Um, it doesn't really matter too much. So you can do it either way. This will at least just assure that your bathrooms don't get backed up. Because if your bathrooms get backed up with wastewater, they will just not work anymore. Uh, we need to hook up a couple of things here before these bathrooms are functional, by the way. We probably need a dupe to load sand. So there's a little bit more maintenance in here than it appears. Let's go ahead and brush in some sand. Have the dupe dig it out. Or I guess it will do it automatically. And then the dupe will load it. We'll start filtering this. And again, this may cause a problem because the polluted water that got here first is only at 20 degrees, which is another reason why this can be a little bit tricky. So we have two different temperatures of water coming out of here. Oh, that's because I messed this up. This is supposed to be 86 because that's what it spawns at out of this uh, vent. So we'll see the example of it breaking the pipes here really quickly. You can see the cold damage happens. It starts just turning into blocks of ice. That can definitely be an issue. So because of this issue, I might want to prioritize one source over the other to make sure that that's in there before any of the frozen stuff is. Or I could also distribute this to somewhere else. It is very useful to have water around uh, just so that you can cool stuff. So if I wanted to store this for something in cooling, I could send it over here. So if I wanted to have a, a tank that I could then distribute out for, say, cooling a volcano, which we will do in a bit, I could actually have it sent down a totally separate line and be sent over here instead. Go up here, something like this. Bridge it again. Go up here and do that. Another thing we could do is we could actually have totally separate storage for these two different things. And we could use this as storage for another building that's gonna be useful later in the game. And that is the uh, metal refinery. The metal refinery will basically take very cold liquid and it will put out very hot liquid once you refine something. So let's grab this metal refinery, let's put it here. And by the way, I know we're still on this bathroom topic, but we need actual water we can use for this first. So I wanna talk about how to work with different temperatures of stuff. Uh, so let's go ahead and hook this up. And I want this to go to the metal refinery first before it goes anywhere else. We can also do a little bit of a trick where we want to have separate storage for the metal refinery like that. And then uh, we can just send the water back in at the place that it's supposed to go on our regular lines. So let's go ahead and run water from here on a bridge so it prioritizes this tank before it goes somewhere else. Into the input, we wanna go green to white. Let's go ahead and get a metal refinery, put it down there. Let's go green to white here. And then again, green to white on the polluted water because it's gonna put out hot polluted water. So let's go ahead and do that. And for situations like this that can be a little bit awkward, we might have to traverse over a couple of different pipes. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can handle this. Uh, you can avoid all this altogether. You can have it merge up with a pipe that you know is going to go to the right place. So instead, I'm going to go this way so that it goes down this pipe, down here, and merges into that. And there will be no backup because there's no like intakes on this line over here. So yeah, that's what I would do in those situations. Let's get rid of this stuff. Whoops. Okay, now we have all this stuff set up. Let's have this uh, refining some metal for us, and we'll go ahead and throw a duplicate in there. Let's fill this with oxygen. 
the duplicate can actually breathe. And let's go ahead and spawn a duplicate. Let's see who we get. We got Liam, who's spawning in midair. All right, there we go. And we want this to produce a whole bunch of metal for us. Let's go ahead and brush in some copper ore. We'll do that. And then we want this to make as much copper ore as we can possibly get. And finally, we will hook this up to power. All right, once these lazy dupes wake up, they will get on top of that. But in the meantime, we're at least storing all the water that we need for this in this tank. And we are filling this thing up as soon as we possibly can with water so that as soon as it's available, our dupe will use it. And this will heat up our water to the point that it will not freeze our pipes once it gets down there. So this dupe is going to be frantically trying to repair this because we have a bunch of water in here that is too cold. Uh, we could flush this system, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that right now just to avoid any of the annoyance, but that can definitely be a problem. Let's get rid of the rest of these pipes and I'll just rebuild them really fast. All right, so we got this going here. I'm going to run our pipes through that, down, over, join there and there, and then finally down into our water setup. Rebuild our pipes. You can see how annoying this might be if you have to repipe everything. Um, this was not intended as a part of this tutorial, but it is good that we're showing it because this can be a lot of maintenance if you do something wrong. All right, so we've got those pipes cleaned out. We have cold water coming up here. You can see this is uh, the pipe or the temperature that's sitting in here is this 20.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we have cleaned this up so that polluted water that's coming from here is at 86. And basically, whatever gets to this uh, setup here first is going to be totally fine. We could also separate the germy water from the clean water and have them refined at different times as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of up to you as to how you want to set that up. So we have water coming in here at that 20.2 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's coming out at 54. So just refining this metal is producing hotter water than what came in. This can be useful for us, though, because we are getting the metal refinement, which is very, very expensive. But we're also getting water that's now of an appropriate temperature to actually um, create uh, regular water for us. So let's hook the rest of this stuff back up. And let's go ahead and get rid of all this water. Sample, fill, there we go. All right, so we're now getting refined, or sorry, refined water. Yeah, let's call it that. We're now getting clean water being sent in here from the outputs that we have. And we can see what's being prioritized. The flow from here is being prioritized from the flow of our geyser. You can set it up however you want. It's flowing down here and into these uh, areas that we have dictated or determined that these are gonna be germy water and into these bathrooms. So the bathrooms will eventually get filled up. We could uh, spawn a couple of dupes in here and wait until they actually have to use the bathroom. Can be a little bit annoying to wait for that. So let's go to super speed. There we go. Eventually they will need to use these and we'll be able to see the flow out of the bathrooms and finally close this loop to go all the way back, back into our storage and eventually refined. And we now have a full loop set up. I will also mention that some people do like to set up a separate area for this that kind of retains its own water. Um, I'm not, I don't think that's essential. A lot of people do, oh, here we go, by the way. Good thing I've got that in time. Uh, a lot of people do think that's kind of essential, but I don't, only because uh, you're basically just reserving water that's going to go into your bathrooms anyway, which could be done with a couple of tanks, and it could be mixed into your normal water setup. You'll ultimately have to vent water off anyway, which is exactly what these bathrooms are already doing, so I kind of don't really see a big purpose behind that unless you are worried about your water stability, but if you're already having water problems, then not having bathrooms to use is like the least of your worries at that point. So if you want to just store extra water here, like you could store extra clean water in here and you could store extra water coming out of here, it would effectively be the same thing. Um, I don't know. I just don't find that to be all, all that compelling. So the dupes are going to flush the toilets. The polluted water is going to come up here and go down these pipes. They should wash their hands as they leave, which I'll just send them all out. And they will be forced to wash their hands as they leave. And I do have an equal number of sinks to bathrooms, by the way, just to make sure that everybody, if they all go to the bathroom at the same at the same time, can all use the sinks. So there we go. We have a complete flow. It's just going to flow right back into our tanks, flow right back into our water refinement. And yeah, like I mentioned, uh, I'm going to have a whole video about water network maintenance uh, that we're not going to worry about right now. 
Uh, Liam, I don't really need you anymore. Your example and your purpose has been served. Uh, I'm going to have a whole video about water maintenance, but this is the general piping that you will use. And just remember that at the beginning of this video, we started with absolutely none. Uh, so this is definitely an example of how fast this can come up and how this whole setup can look intimidating. But we literally just did this in, you know, 20-ish minutes. And it should be pretty straightforward on a lot of the, the things that we were doing because we learned about, about all that earlier. Let's talk about one more pretty practical example. Let's pretend this is our whole base, this area right here. Ideally, for your duplicants to work and do stuff effectively, you want to have your base filled with oxygen, right? The problem is that duplicants and other buildings and opening up other biomes, that can introduce a whole bunch of junk gas into your base. So let's do that. Let's get some carbon dioxide. We'll kind of paint it in here like this. Just because your dupes will be all around the map and doing them at different points. Let's do some uh, chlorine, which can happen if you open up different biomes. So let's kind of make this pretty big. Let's say a big blob of chlorine came out from right here for whatever reason. Let's say you also get some natural gas in there. Maybe you get some flatulent dupes. Let's go ahead and brush that in as well. Natural gas. All right, and then I'll turn this to super speed and show you how you can deal with all this stuff using different piping techniques. So let's unpause this. Go to super speed and you can see it all kind of settling towards the bottom. Just like the liquids that we showed earlier. Oh, who's making a mess? I don't need you anymore, Bert. Get out of here. So you can see all the liquids are kind of starting to settle at, or liquids. You can see all the gases are kind of starting to settle down at the bottom. That's because the more dense gases will start to settle towards the bottom, kind of like liquids do. Gases are a lot better about it. Liquids can be kind of finicky. But let me turn this on to super speed so that everything kind of settles down there. You can see up here there's no carbon dioxide, even though we spawned it all. It will gradually sink to the bottom. And at the bottom of your base, you'll get this really gross layer of stuff that's all gases that your duplicants can't breathe, which means they can't really effectively work down there. So we need some way to get rid of all this. So let's set up something to get rid of all this. And the way that I like to do it is I like to have a couple of pumps somewhere in your base that all pump either the excess out into space or into tanks that you might use or for the case of natural gas into natural gas generators so you can generate some power. So what I'll do is I'll put these gas pumps kind of towards the bottom of my base somewhere. I'll usually spread them out a little bit like this. Uh, depending on what type of ventilation you need, I usually only go with about two at maximum. If you have a huge number of dupes, sometimes I can go a little bit higher than that, but yeah. So what I'll want to do is I can join up their pipes, do something like this and not make a mistake. And eventually we're going to get a big mixture of gases in here. There's going to be carbon dioxide, there's going to be chlorine and natural gas. And if I clear all that out, eventually I'm going to be sucking up oxygen. Now, because we want to not uh, waste power on just moving oxygen, or if we don't want to vent oxygen out into space, we can put a little bit of automation on this. I'm going to be as simplistic as possible, but let's say we put something here like this. Actually, maybe a little bit closer. And I, what I want to set up with this automation is I want these pumps to turn on if this layer right here is anything other than oxygen. And uh, there's, there's going to be a whole tutorial about this. I have talked about this a few times. So I'm just going to set this up really fast. Uh, it's going to be a gas element sensor going into a not gate into a filter gate. Um, if you want to know more about this, like I said, check out the automation video that talks about it. Um, and any one of my playthroughs, I will set this up over and over and over because it's one of the most useful setups in the whole game. So I'm just going to get on this really fast. This needs to prove to me that there actually is oxygen there and it's not just some junk gas floating around. And I'm just going to set this to oxygen. All right, so now we have some automation set up so that if this detects anything other than oxygen here, it's going to get rid of it or send it somewhere else. Basically somewhere that's not in my base so that all this area can be breathed by dupes and worked in easily. So we need to have some central filtration point. Uh, by the way, let's set up some power for these guys before we forget. We need to have some some kind of central filtration point. And I'm going to use the tricks that we used before to filter this. So the first thing that I want to filter is this natural gas, because I don't want to just send this out into space. What I would do typically is just draw something like this that goes all the way up into space. And once you vent something out into space, which has no like backing here, it'll just delete it. So this is a cheap way just to get rid of gases that you don't want. Um, so I'll do something like this. 
Natural gas in particular is something I want to keep, so let's say we have a setup like this for the natural gas generators. Uh, we also want to store this, by the way, so I'm just going to have a storage area for natural gas. You could put it in the uh, containers, but I'm just going to do it this way for right now. So I'm going to set up a high-pressure vent to go into here, so I want to save it. And I'm going to use a gas shutoff, which is very similar to the liquid shutoff. So I'm going to do something like this and say that if this pipe has natural gas flowing along it, I want it to go here and be intercepted rather than just being blown out into space. Let's set up some power. And we need to set up one more thing, which is a bit of automation on the actual pipe itself. I want to detect uh, natural gas. If it detects natural gas, I want to enable this shutoff, which means that it will override whatever's flowing along this pipe and it'll flow here instead. So let's set this to natural gas because that's what we want to detect for. And then these will turn on as soon as the automation allows them to. So we'll go ahead and fast forward that. We should be pretty close, I think. Control U to make it go faster. There we go. So we have stuff coming along these pipes. And it's going to be a mixture of a bunch of different gases, mostly carbon dioxide, because that's what's the lowest. Now, since this is not natural gas, this will just get bypassed. This will just get vented out into space so that I uh, don't actually uh, do anything with it. This is just going to clear space down here. So let me just watch the pipes, and we'll turn this on to super speed. Actually, no, this is chlorine. Once we get some natural gas, I'll show that the shutoff is actually working here and that it gets taken over and gets sent into this. So here we go. Here's a packet of natural gas. This packet of natural gas should trigger our automation as soon as it gets to the tile that this is on. So here we go. Anticipation's building. What's going to happen? I don't know. There we go. It detected that it was natural gas, so this is now on. And the natural gas is going to get filtered uh, via this gas shutoff because that's enabled right now. And whatever is on this line, if there's an input, it's going to steal it. So steals the natural gas and it sends it in here. And eventually this is all going to fill up with natural gas, which we can then use for power. Everything else is going to get bypassed. Now let's say, for example, we accidentally suck up some oxygen. So let's go ahead and spawn some more oxygen down here, which definitely can happen with these types of setups. What I don't want to have happen is I don't want to just blow this oxygen out into space. So we accidentally have some oxygen in these lines now. We can use the exact same idea, except for we can just put like a high pressure vent or a gas vent or something like that along this line and have it only turn on if we detect oxygen using the same automation that we talked about before. So gas element sensor, so it could be an automation. And this will only open if it detects oxygen, if, as long as we set it that way, which there's some funny stuff in here, by the way, rock gas, lol, it's so hot. All right, anyway. So oxygen. We detect oxygen, we want to just vent it back into our base. And this is the exact same idea as the gas shutoff, except for we're not using any power on this. So this is another option you can use just to filter out stuff along a line. So the oxygen's coming up here. Let's just uh, build up the anticipation for a little while. It'll get skipped by this first one because it's not natural gas and we didn't set it up to filter that. But once it gets here, it will activate there we go. You can see it being on because it's detecting oxygen right now. And when it gets to this vent, it'll just get dropped out. So it's no longer in the pipe. So anytime we see oxygen, it's just going to filter it out and it'll drop it right back into our base. So this setup is something that I do literally every game. Uh, this is something that's going to be useful to keep your base as breathable as possible. Otherwise, you will get this big nasty soup of gases that really inhibit your dupes from working. And by the way, all the other stuff that we don't want is being vented out into space, which right now is carbon dioxide. This might not be true as the DLC comes out. You may just need to store this somewhere, but the filtration uh, methods using this piping will still be the same. Uh, so at least these lessons will still be valuable. Or if you wanted to keep this chlorine, you could do the exact same thing that we did with the natural gas here. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to talk about that example. Let's talk about one more example that's on a uh, different map here because I'm kind of out of space. Uh, yeah, I'm out of space. There's nowhere to build, but this is more of like an advanced build and I like to break them up into those sections So this will be the last example before we go back to the main base to see all this stuff in action And I'll talk about like real real life versions of all these things that I've showed you thus far Just to show you how they contribute to the base and hopefully to make you not be so intimidated About using some of these things once you get later on. So let's jump over there 
Okay, I'm sure that this looks a little bit terrifying right now because we have an open volcano that is about to erupt. And it's about to erupt at a place that we might be living or working or something like that. Nobody wants to deal with an erupting volcano. So that's just so annoying when you're trying to do stuff like play games. So what we're going to do about this is we're going to cool this using some steam turbines. Uh, so let's start hooking some of this stuff up. Steam turbines have outputs, and in this particular case, the output, I will want to go right back into the same room so that we retain the steam that's already in here. The steam is basically going to be the method of transferring heat from the magma into the steam turbines. So we'll be generating electricity off of this, and you can see that they're turning on already because the steam that I put in here was already pretty hot. So let's, uh, let's just spawn some magma really quick and uh, kind of demonstrate this. Let's get our sandbox tools up. Magma, not nagma, and not comma. Oh my. Wow. All right. Please excuse my total failures, but uh, yeah, let's just spawn a little bit. Let's spawn like one there and one there. So what will happen is this will superheat all the steam. The magma will eventually cool down uh, to the point that... Uh, it will harden the magma into some rock, which it may take just a little bit because there's a lot here. But the point is that the steam turbines are going to cool this. Oh, by the way, I need a place to actually drop off in this vent. The point is that the steam turbines are going to cool this. Uh, but the other problem with this is that these steam turbines are producing a lot of heat, and they will eventually overheat if we're not careful. So I'm going to show you a way to actually cool these things down using some of the piping methods that we talked about, and especially using one of the kind of advanced methods of using pipes and uh, using these sh uh, liquid shutoffs to sort of keep cool water in the place that you want it to stay until you're ready to flush it out. So what I'm going to do here is I have a pool of cold polluted water, which we'll worry about how to actually produce that here in just a second. But let's pretend we already have this pool of cold water here. I'm going to put a uh, liquid uh, pump down here. I'm going to pump cold water up to this area. And then when it gets into the area that I need it to actually cool stuff, I'm going to use radiant pipe. I'm going to put some bridges across these like that. Again, the flow is always going to be like the, the flow on these pipes are, I should have mentioned this before. But the flow on this bridge is actually listed on the pipe. It's going to go left to right. You can also think about how we talked about it earlier. It's going to flow away from the green and into the white. So it's a little bit of a reverse way to think about it, but yeah. So I'm going to put bridges over these. I'm going to have it loop back to go back all the way to over here, loop back the other way, and then finally go out. So I'm going to go like this, go like this. This whole room is effectively just going to be filled with pipes at this point. And instead of having it just vent directly out, I'm going to stop here and go back to my insulated pipe afterwards. So what I'm going to put here is I'm going to put a liquid shutoff, which I'm going to hook up just like this. And then I'm going to hook it up to power because we need that. Then I'm also going to hook it up to some automation so that if this room ever gets too hot, um, I want this pu these pipes to be flushed. I'll show you exactly how this works. So I'm going to hook it up something like this. We want a buffer gate so that we flush the whole room. I'm going to talk about this a whole bunch of times, by the way. So if you've seen in my other tutorials, this should look really familiar. Um, so I want to set this for about, I don't know, 60 seconds to make sure the whole room is flushed out. So what this is going to do is, once this is all hooked up... Oh, I need power here. Uh, sure, whatever. What this is going to do is this is going to send some really cold water up here. This is 35 degrees Fahrenheit, just barely above freezing. Going to send it up here, and it's going to fill up all these pipes, these radiant pipes. And they're just going to sit inside this pipe, or sit inside these pipes, until they need to be removed. So... The hydrogen here is getting a little bit warmer, but as soon as we start pumping it in, you can see that the temperature of the room starts to fall a little bit if you look at the hydrogen here. I know it's hard to see, but it is falling because we started putting some uh, cold water in here. So the, the cold water in the radiant pipes is going to be staying in here until we've decided that the room is too hot. So the the basically the way this is going to work is that the... Uh, the water inside the pipes is going to heat up because these steam turbines are producing a lot of heat. As soon as the whole room gets too hot, we're going to flush it out because this thermo sensor is going to activate whenever this is above 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. At that point, I'm just going to say, this room's too hot. I want to flush this out. 
and I want to flush this out for about 60 seconds. And the thing that's going to be preventing all this is this liquid shut off. So this is a good way to say, I want water to specifically stick in these pipes until I tell it to leave. When I tell it to leave, I want it to go back down to this area, which I'm just going to put a little uh, vent in here so that we return it back to the cold water and we pump in new cold water. So we'll get there eventually. I'm just going to kind of rush this. Let's say if it's anywhere above 70, then I want new water. So this is gonna satisfy it right away. As soon as that is saying, oh, it's too hot in here, it's gonna turn on this liquid shut off and it's going to pass the liquid through that and eventually back down. And we're gonna get new water to come in here and replace the hot water. So we're now getting new cold water coming in here, coming at about 35, coming out at about 72. So this is gonna be one of the most common cooling solutions in the entire game, is to have pipes that you're intentionally backing up whenever you need the water to stay in a certain area. Now that the room temperature has fallen below 75, I'm gonna keep this on for a little while just so I can assure that the whole contents of all these pipes are replaced. As soon as they're replaced, then uh, we're just gonna chill until the water room gets too hot again. So this is a very common way to cool down anything you need just by using radiant pipes and a shutoff. Uh, very cool, very useful setup here. So definitely emulate that if you want to do any sort of advanced cooling. By the way, something you might have noticed is that we're now dumping warmer water in here. So the temperature on this side is 35. Temperature on this side is in the 40s already because we just dumped some hot water in there. You might be thinking, uh, well, this is soon not going to be cold water anymore. And how did you get cold water in the first place? So let's talk about that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a new setup right here if you're wondering what this is for. I'm going to be using some aqua tuners to cool this water and the aqua tuners heat is going to be transferred into this steam and then cooled by this steam turbine. This aqua tuner and steam turbine combo is one of the strongest things in the game and the cooling for these steam turbines is going to be the exact same as this one. So you're cooling water but you're also like cooling the thing that cools the thing that got heated up by the thing that's cooling water. <laughs> Long line of logic there, but basically you're turning the excess heat from the aqua tuner that's generated into power and getting cooling off of it. So let's set up these steam turbines the same way. We need an exhaust for these to go back into the same room like we have up here. Drop it off. And then in this room, we're going to put a couple of, uh, let's see, this is in utilities. Put a couple of thermal aqua tuners in here. Make sure to build it out of steel. And you'll notice that these things do have inputs and outputs, so we need to set up some uh, piping for that. So for each one of these, I will have a separate thing that will activate if the water is too warm. So I'm going to set up some thermo sensors here. And if either, of, if either of these detect that the water around them is too hot, like if it is above, let's say, 40 degrees, um, I want them to turn on and I want them to send water up into these aqua tuners. The aqua tuners will cool them and it'll return the water back to the same general area. So I'm going to put a couple of extra uh, setups here. And I may want to move this around just so that I'm not actually crossing lines too much. I want to have a separate drop off point for different reasons. Um, like if I want to have water being sent up here, I don't want to block up something else because I can only send 10 kilo kilograms of uh, water through at a time. So we've got separate vents. One is going to be, so, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Let's route the water that we want cooled up to one of these aqua tuners. So we'll do something like this. And then we want it to go out. Whoops, we don't want it to do that. We want it to go out. We will just go back to one of these exhausts. Same thing for up here. We'll just wire it up the same way. And again, you might want to put a little bit of foresight into how you uh, pipe some of this stuff because now we like can't go back across here. You can't like send it back in and I don't want to send it to the same pipe because it's not going to drain fast enough. So you'll have to plan this out pretty good. And in the real examples, I will show you how to plan this out in a way that keeps it all nice and tidy. So we also need power for these things. Again, I'm just going to use these cheater power sources because those are easier. All right, now these are detecting that the water is definitely too warm. We want it to be above 40. 
Uh, we can cheat just a little bit and we'll go ahead and heat this up and pretend like this is, uh, whoops, I want to sample this. This is going to be faster. We'll pretend we already have pretty warm water in here. Let's put like 60 degree water all around here. And then this should detect it and be like, whoa, this is too hot. I want to definitely cool this down before we send it out to anywhere else it needs to be cooled. So the general flow that I have is new hot and cold water both drop in here. It will have to pass all the way over before it is sent out anywhere to do any cooling. And then it'll all be returned back to the same spot. So let's watch the flow here. We have water being sent up to these aqua tuners into their inputs. Out of the outputs come the cooled water. So the water that's going in is at 50 degrees in this one, and it's coming out at about 25. So it drops it by quite a bit, and this is a nice cooling setup that you can have. Remember, we still need to cool our steam turbines, so let's set up that as well, which we probably want to pull, not necessarily from here, because this is only for cooling. I'm just going to reserve these for cooling only, at least for, sorry, for making this pool of water colder. For using this pool of water to make other things colder, I'm going to use this same pump since it's usually idle. So we'll just send it up to the same place. And again, we might want to have another liquid vent here. So we should probably put a little bit of foresight into how we do this. I'm going to be a little bit sloppy because our real example is going to show how to do it the better way. So we need some bridges to go over these. Like so. Draw some pipes like this. And again, at the last space, I'm going to stop. I'm going to use a liquid shutoff. I'm going to go back to my insulated pipe. And then I'm going to dump it out into uh, its own separate vent. This vent may get blocked up, though, so that's why you really need to plan this ahead. So you can see how messy this gets if you don't actually plan this well, which I am definitely not doing right now because I'm trying to hurry and also talk at the same time. So I'm going to do something really sloppy like this, and you'll see what it looks like when we do it the right way. So we now have a full loop which is uh, coming from here all the way up into here. Going to be chilling in these insulated pipes, or these radiant pipes, until we tell it, okay, uh, it's too hot in here, let's dump it back out. So let's hook this up to power, and let's hook up our automation. Want to make sure we get rid of all this hot water once it gets too hot. There we go. And let's dump this for, I don't know, 30 seconds. This is a smaller room. So if it's ever above, let's just say, uh, let's say 80 for now, so we fill up the whole room, just to demonstrate this example again. Uh, water is going to be coming up here. This is very cold water once again, 35 degrees, which is definitely going to cool this water down, or rather cool this, uh, this room down. So here we go. Steam turbines are still producing heat because we still need to cool this, uh, these aqua tuners, which produce a lot. Effectively, all of the cooling that it does on this water just gets transferred into the steam around it. Um, so it's kind of just like a trade-off, but you get the you get the bonus once you hook up the steam turbine because you're using all that excess heat for power. So let's say this room gets too hot. Let's say if it's anywhere above 65, that's too much. Dump it back out. And now we are dropping this back off. And note that we have water flowing all to separate uh, vents here. So that's definitely something that we want to do. So we now have it flowing, and if we were to have this one flowing as well, we would potentially have four places that were all venting water at the same time, which is why really organized plumbing matters a lot. So that's all I have for like a more advanced setup. Um, let's jump to the real base, which has the most advanced stuff, because this is like all of the concepts being molded in together into one. I'll kind of gloss over some of the builds there, but a lot of them should look really familiar. So let's go there next, and then that'll be it. So I'll see you there soon. All right, we're back on the hot pot, which was a run that I did on the Oasis asteroid. I have a full playthrough of that if you want to check that out. But this was the overlay that we saw at the very beginning of the video that looks nutty, but hopefully a lot of this should look a little bit more familiar. So let's start to break this down. And these should all be examples that we've seen so far. So uh, this looks like a whole mess network of piping because it is, but also because this is the hottest map in the game can see on the outside at some of these points and it's like basically everywhere other than the central area it's all super hot to the point that like nothing will grow your dupes will just be injured if they're going outside so this map requires a lot of cooling uh, so it's a constant struggle 
So if you don't know a lot of good piping and cooling techniques, then you'll probably die on this map. But let's take a look at this. This flow, I love this so much when this is all operating, by the way, so I'm just going to keep this paused until we can see the whole thing in action. But we just saw some setups with uh, aqua tuners. I'm using salt water on this map only because that was a lot more accessible to me earlier than polluted water. So you can use either one. You can also use oil or petroleum for cooling, or sorry, well, you could use petroleum actually. Probably not very common, but you could also use ethanol, which can be something you can find around the map randomly in some uh, setups, or you can produce it from wood or whatever else. But yeah, so I'm using salt water on here and the piping from here my flow goes left to right in terms of like a mixture of cold and hot water. It'll get intercepted by these liquid pumps if it needs to be cooled and then sent out elsewhere by these pumps if it's cold enough or basically any water that's here, it'll just send it out. It doesn't really care. Um, but this will just be the thing that's assuring that this pool stays cold. And this is what gets distributed to actually cool things. The piping on these is all in nice, neat rows. Uh, heading down into their individual aqua tuners. So like this pipe, you can follow it. This leads into the intake of this aqua tuner. This is flipped backwards from what we just saw in the last example, by the way. Then its exhaust will head back out and go out into its own dedicated drop-off point. You can see how many vents I have here for a bunch of different purposes. This should ideally match the number of, of pumps you have in here. And you can see in this one, it's a lot, seven. Uh, so this one might actually have one, two, three, four, five, eight. I don't remember what this other one is for. I think these are temporary pipes that I set up for some reason. Uh, we'll get back to that. So what I do in, in managing the huge networks of pipes like this is I try to manage having like a circle and it's all flowing in one direction ideally. Um, so everything is kind of flowing clockwise if you could see it that way. And stuff that goes out and gets distributed amongst the map will arrive back somewhere on like the left side of the clock so that it can go back into these vents and this this pumps these uh, piping stay nice and organized um, one thing to help it stay organized you can see there's a couple of random points that i need to actually uh, snake a pipe through basically everything so i'll just have these big long lines of bridges so that something can pass underneath it it's almost like if you think of this as like a freeway and then if you need to ever build a road underneath it or over the top of it um, you can do it this way so that the whole freeway goes over the top. Uh, so that's basically what you could envision this as. It's a lot easier than trying to have this one pipe try to like snake its way through with a bunch of bridges. Um, so that's another tip that could definitely be helpful. Um, also in the middle here, you'll notice that I have steam turbines. There's carbon dioxide in here instead of hydrogen. I don't remember why I did it this way. I think it was because hydrogen took a while for me to actually get access to. Um, so yeah, I had this up fairly early for one of these runs, um, but whatever. So you can see the same cooling setup that we had before where we just basically have a bunch of stagnant uh, cold water in here. And as soon as it gets hot enough, which is this right here, it'll dump it back out. Um, so that's how this is all set up. Let me follow this automation because I don't actually see my shutoff. Oh, it's over here. It's just sitting on the outside. Not too big of a deal. So yeah, a lot of this should look fairly familiar. Let's watch this thing in action. I just actually love watching this so much because it's all really nice and neat. So yeah, there you go. We're getting a massive amount of cooling all at once. Let's look at places that it's actually distributed to other than inside here. So if you look at this big room right here, by the way, the temperature is very low because that's how I like it. Um, I have a pipe that snakes all the way through here using this radiant pipe. So if we follow it, it goes from this pump right here across a bridge, across another bridge, all the way over. It's a secondary cooling need. I think this other one goes over to like a steam uh, turbine or rather a steam vent, which we'll take a look at in just a bit. But this all snakes through this big room and that's because I put all of the big heat producers in one room and I'll snake pipe all the way through there using this radiant pipe and we'll use that same trick to have a liquid shut off on the end to make sure that it all sticks in this pipe before it actually gets dumped out. The same cooling setup is going to be seen a whole bunch of times. So we'll just super speed run through it. Here's a steam uh, vent with some steam turbines to generate some power. Same cooling setup here. There's a volcano up here, which is right here. Exactly the same setup here. You can see the cooling. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of different places that use the same thing. Here's my bathrooms. You can see these as well. They're just taking in regular water, which it looks like it comes from a very crazy source. It looks like it comes in from my salt water. I don't know why I have it set up exactly this way. I'd have to go back and look. 
And you can see all the crazy connections that happen here uh, once you get super complicated setups. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something that can happen also. Uh, let's see here. So we've got our bathrooms. Bathrooms will dump out into a separate chamber, just to make sure they don't get backed up before they get sent back over to be refined back into one of these water sieves. So the piping in here can look nutty, but if you really just kind of break it down based upon the things you know, it's not that crazy. There's also some stuff here for like petroleum, which I send up into space to use for rocket fuel or to use for some liquid locks and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. There's some piping here to make some liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which you'll need in order to beat the game. Uh, yeah, lots of crazy piping stuff that can happen here. Let's switch over to our ventilation just so you can see the setups that I have for that. Uh, nothing too wild. You can see just oxygen being distributed throughout the base, and that's pretty straightforward. Some other stuff that's not as super straightforward is I'm doing some filtering on this to make sure that I'm actually blowing out the... Uh, the oxygen here and preserving the hydrogen. I must have been doing some weird filtration over here. Here's my natural gas setup. So I'm storing all my natural gas in these pipes here and then eventually uh, pumping this back up into the actual power generators. The power generators put off some carbon dioxide, which I'm then venting out into space, which eventually gets there by this big long pipe. And then finally, here's the bottom of my base where we do all the filtration of the gases that we don't want. We have the same type of automation set up right here. As long as it has the gases that we need, it travels through there and it will actually intercept uh, packets of oxygen here. I think that I was not quite used to the uh, vents actually having their automation own automation by this point. This happened fairly recently. So I'm using a gas shutoff to vent off the excess oxygen, which is a little bit different than our example, but same type of principle. So yeah, as far as piping goes, oh, by the way, we should show one more thing that we didn't pay a ton of attention to because I have a whole set of tutorials for it, but let's take a look in conveyor rails really fast. Just at a quick glance, you can see all the outputs that I have here for different solids that might need to go to different places. So the piping on those is pretty straightforward. Just goes from an output to an input somewhere, which is weird to think about because this is like a vent. It's weird calling it an input, but... I always try to think about it in a more generic sense of it goes away from the green and into the white. Uh, but yeah, there's a couple of bridges here just to avoid crossing lines. There's a lot of merging of lines depending on what's coming down on it. So like this will all be like eggs and stuff like that or uh, meat and it'll all go to like this central area where I sort it and send it to the right places. So this is almost like a really advanced filtration system for solids that you wouldn't normally have for liquids. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to call that out really quickly because that's it again follows the exact same principles But shipping can have a little bit of nuance to it, which is why I have a whole separate tutorial Okay, it's been a little while since I put out a mega tutorial, but I thought that this went pretty well Let me know if you have any other questions about anything and I will more than happily respond to a majority of the comments um, So yeah, leave them down there if you have any other questions if you have any other suggestions for other tutorials or things that you're struggling with Please let me know and I will get to them. And that is typically how a lot of these things are prioritized. Um, I will have a generic idea of what I want to do, but if anybody ever leaves a comment of like, hey, I need to know how to do this thing and I don't already have a tutorial for it, that'll usually be one of the next videos that I make. So hit me up if you have any questions. Uh, thanks for watching. Check out my channel for some other tutorials and playthroughs and all kinds of fun stuff. Until the next video, I'll see you guys really soon.